Welcome to the CNO's Navy Birthday All Hands Call. I'm Petty Officer Brandi Wills and I'll be your moderator for this event. We'll be taking your questions from around the world via social media and satellite. With us to answer your questions, we have Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Jonathan Greenert, and Master Chief Petty Officer of the Navy, Mike Stevens. CNO, the Thank floor is yours. Thank you very much, MC1 Wells. Hello everybody and welcome shipmates, welcome around the fleet and around the world. It's really a great, great day. We need to do three very important things today. One, eat cake. Number two, re-enlist sailors. And three, listen and learn. And I'm here with my favorite rock star, the Master Chief <laughs> Petty Officer of the Navy. Thanks. Master Chief, thanks for being here today. No, thank you. It's good to be uh, here. Let's start off with something that you and I really like to do. What do you say we re-enlist some sailors? I'm ready, sir. You all right with that? Yes, sir. All right, that's good. Hey, everybody. How are you doing today? You ready to go? Yes, sir. All right. Who ya? Who ya? All right. That's what I'm talking about. Okay. Uh, out here in the on the audience, if you will, uh, please attention to oath. Raise your right hand and please repeat after me. I state your name. I am John Wilkes. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. And I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. And I will obey the orders of the President of the United States. And I will obey the orders of the President of the United States. And the officers appointed over me. And the officers appointed over me. In accordance with regulations. In accordance with regulations. And the Uniform Code of Military Justice. And the Uniform Code of Military Justice. So help me God. So help me God. All right, welcome back all in. Right. You all right, huh? Sounds good. All right. Okay, let's bring some points. Let's see who it is we have here today. Petty Officer Toon, where are you from, buddy? Uh, up now, I've been one, sir. Up, no, no, no. Where'd you grow up? Uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. Sir. Raleigh, North Carolina. All right. Yes, Tobacco Road. Where'd you grow up, Petty Officer Jarrett? Emporia, Virginia, sir. Emporia, Virginia? Yes, sir. All right, very nice. Redskins guy? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right, where'd you grow up, Petty Officer? San Diego, California. San Diego? Oh, man, what a nice <laughs> place. We got them out there. Petty Officer Noble, how about you? Pretty good, sir. I'm from El Centro, California. El Centro, California. Nice place. Petty Officer Blair, how about you? Yes, sir. Uh, I'm from Dayton, Ohio. Dayton, Ohio? Okay, the Flyers, huh? <laughs> yes, sir. Very good. Yes, sir. All right. Congratulations. Thank you. First rank, left face, fall out. Chief, where'd you grow up, buddy? Conway, Arkansas. Where's that again? Conway, Arkansas. Conway, Arkansas. You yes, don't sir. have one of them sweet pigs on your head, do you? Sir, how you doing? Yes, sir. Where are you from? Maryland. Gaithersburg, Maryland. I'm a Redskins fan. I thought you were a Redskins fan. <laughs> where are you from, Pedro? South Florida, Thanks, sir. River Yes, sir. All right, South Florida, very nice. Yes, Foster, where are you from? Monroe, Wisconsin, sir. Monroe, Wisconsin, nice place. Yes, Burleson, how about you? Kenneth Square, Pennsylvania, sir. Kenneth Square, Pennsylvania. Yes, you have Eagles territory, right? <laughs> yes, sir. Very nice. Second rank, left face, fall out. Yes, Vandenberg, how about you? Where are you from? Colorado Springs, Colorado, sir. Oh, nice place. Too much Air Force, though. Yes, sir. Our Chief Butler. Oh, I'm so sorry. Well, how about you? Where are you from? Mobile, Alabama, sir. Mobile, Alabama. Very nice. Are you roll tide or are you uh, roll war tie, eagle? Sir. Roll tide. All right. <laughs> there's some Mac. How about you? Where are you from? San Augustine, Florida. San Augustine, Florida. Yes, you look pretty young for San Augustine. Isn't that where old people are? Yes, sir. Well, that's the final youth. Uh, you have it. Yes, sir. All right, I got it. Chief, where are you from, buddy? Grants Pass, Oregon, sir. Grants Pass, Oregon. Grants Pass, Oregon. Very nice country up there. Congratulations, Chief. All right. Very good. Third rank, left face. Fall out. Okay, how about we'll talk a little bit and then we'll go to Q&A. Does that sound good with you, Pastor Wills? Absolutely. All right, all right. So, uh, first of all, a little bit, where are we right now in this government shutdown? It's a regrettable situation, but like uh, all sailors throughout history, throughout our heritage, we are where we are and we make do with the best, best we can do. And uh, what I tell you is those folks that are out there getting it done today, they have what they need, they're on station, they're where it matters to do what matters when, when they're called upon. And that's what's important. Those that are next to deploy, they have what they need and we'll make sure that that continues to work on. But we have some of our civilian shipmates who are out there who are furloughed and we need to think about them. Uh, a lot of people have come back to work, we'll get things moving with our shipyards moving, uh, getting and going and, and uh, some of our support functions for our sailors that stuff's going to get going, but don't forget your civilian shipmates out there uh, as, as we're out and about thinking about it. 
Let's talk a little bit about our heritage and uh, what this all means, this 238th birthday. Last year, you might recall, we talked a lot about the War of 1812 and some of the important battles. And, and in 1812, it got started. But this is the 200th commemoration, if you will, of the Battle of Lake Erie. And what about that? Well, it was the Battle of Lake Erie where Oliver Hazard Perry and his crews really, really turned the tide up and around the Great Lakes area, which really turned the tide in that War of 1812. It was through their innovation, their perseverance, and really their skill. They were, they were confident and proficient sailors. Long range guns, good guns, they practiced, they got things done, and they defeated the British in that particular big naval battle. And they had a bold, they had a confident leader in Oliver Hazard Perry. And there's, they're not all that different from you all today and all those folks that are out there and about. They had a force that was dedicated, that was innovative, that changed when they needed to. And as I think about this year, as you think about this year, it's the 40th anniversary of the all-volunteer force. That's our asymmetric advantage. That's what makes you, all of you, and all of you who are out within the sound of my voice different from any other Navy in the world. It makes you the finest Navy in the world, the all-volunteer force. Those of you that are willing to step up and get done what needs to get done when it needs to get done. So I thank you all very much for that. And with that, let's get some quick questions and answers. Let's listen and learn, Mick Pond, what do you say? I'm ready. All right. All right, sir, our first question comes from USS Simpson, FFG 56. Standing by on the phone is Petty Officer Dan Kurt. Petty Officer Dan Kurt, go ahead. Good afternoon, sir, how are you? Good, 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 good thanks. Um, our question for you here is, uh, how will the national health care changes affect TRICARE and the other military health benefits we have? Well, the they won't change at all. Uh, they are two completely separate entities. TRICARE is f for DOD and for active and for their, their, for their uh, if you will, families and for retirees. Two completely different entities, so there is no impact. Simple answer. Our next question is coming in from Afghanistan. Afghanistan, when you are ready, go ahead. Hello. Go ahead, Afghanistan. Good afternoon, sir. Hello. Good afternoon, Mass Chief. I am. Good afternoon, sir. Sir. Good afternoon, Mass Chief. I am IS3 Row, and my question will actually be directed toward Mass Chief. As the Navy goes to a smaller, smarter Navy force. What incentives are being established to keep sailors in for 20 years since most people who join just want to do four years so they can gain a trade or schooling, then get out and take what they've gained in the Navy somewhere else? That's a great question. And what I'll share with you is I think that by and large, the Navy is doing the things right now that are necessary to support our sailors and their families and help them prepare for life in and out of the Navy. Uh, our numbers uh, for retention show us right now that we're, we're getting it pretty close to right. Uh, however, we're always going to look for ways uh, that we can improve uh, both the quality of life of our sailors and families and just as importantly, their quality of work. Thank you for your question. Okay, and our next question is coming in via social media. Where's that located? No. First off, happy Social birthday. Media, Iowa? <laughs> <laughs> Mick Pond Stevens and Admiral Greener. My question is for Mick Pond Stevens. Okay. Are we going to see any additional changes to CPO 365 guidance for 2013 2014? Thank you, Mick Pond. Hooyah. Another great question. And what I'll share with you is I have no intentions of making any significant changes to CPO 365 for this upcoming season. Uh, I want to make sure that our chief's messes and our first classes and our commands are comfortable with the guidance that's already been issued. Uh, I was just on the phone this morning with one of my fleet master chiefs and what I've asked them to do is capture all the lessons learned from this previous season and we'll take a look at them. And if we believe that there's some areas that we can uh, provide some clarification, uh, I'll issue a, probably a separate memo uh, with that particular guidance, but all in all the guidance is going to remain as is I want all of you to become Excellent at the things that we have and that we own and we control. Thank you, yeah, I'm with you. 
Okay, and now we're going to get a question from one of our audience members. Shipmate, if you can come up and introduce yourself. Hey, Shipmate. How you doing, sir? Petty yeah. Officer Wallace, Office of Naval Intelligence, Farragut Command. How you doing today? Good. Where are you from? Uh, New Orleans, Louisiana, sir. Oh, man. LSU, I suppose, huh? Uh, more Saints, sir. More Saints, 5-0. <laughs> and oh. Yes, sir. I have a question regarding the evaluation system. Are you happy with the current enlisted evaluation system? Have there been any recent reviews of it? And if not, is there any momentum to do so? I'm generally happy with it, the way, the way it lays out today. Uh, I would say uh, what we need to do when we think about evaluating people is be truthful and be objective. Uh, there is a propensity in both evaluation systems, the officer fit rep system, CPO, and our petty officer evaluation system to kind of make people feel good, if you will. And when you move everybody, if you will, close to the top and you don't break them out, you end up uh, leaving people sort of hanging. And when hard decisions have to be made, and I'm going to use that word again, perform to serve, when we got into that system and we got to find out, you know, who is the best and they're all clumped up there, you're effectively turning over people's future to a board or to a large staff. And we don't want that. We need that to be done at the deck plate. Yes, sir. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Our next question we are going to get live from Norfolk. Norfolk, when you're ready, go ahead. All right. Hey, Norfolk. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Mick Pond. I'm OS1 Craft from Navy Expeditionary Combat Command. My question is, with the ground wars winding down in Iraq and Afghanistan, what does the future hold for Navy Expeditionary Combat Command, and how does the CNO plan to employ us? Well, the Naval Expeditionary Combat Command is in high demand. It's very relevant for the things that we need to do today and in the future. So what I'm telling you is the capability that Expeditionary Combat Command brings is relevant for the future. But the capacity that we need to maintain is one a little, it's not affordable in the fiscal and the amount of money we'll have in the future and in the, for the needs of the future. So let me put it maybe more succinctly. We need the capability that you bring we don't need the capacity, so we need to bring it down to a proper level that makes sense for our future. All right, sir, it looks like the next question we have coming in is from our sailors in San Diego. All right. Charm City. Hello, San Diego. Can I soon. Good afternoon, sir. I'm Mick Pond, GM1 Fiber from Naval Special Warfare Center. My question for you is in regard to retirement pay. I've heard that there's going to be a decrease in the retirement pay, and I was wondering if you foresee the military having a decrease in the pay or no retirement at all in the forthcoming future. I'll take this one. Okay. No, there, there is no uh, reduction in the retirement, in retirement pay. I can't foresee not having a retirement system or we wouldn't have much of an all-volunteer force. That I can assure you. Now, there is a commission that was assigned by the Congress to look at uh, pay, entitlements, and, and retirement. That commission is just formed. They are just getting started. The Department of Defense, in the form of the Secretary of Defense, he will provide an input for them to consider. This is a long way out. This is a few years out before the recommendations of this commission really get laid out and accommodated by our Congress. But this much I'll tell you, and everybody in the sound of my voice today, if you wear a uniform today, that is your retirement system, the one that you joined up to. That's the way it is right now. There's no reduction in the near term. All right, sir. Um I was just told we have another phone call coming in. This time it is from Petty Officer Carl Anthony. He's deployed on USS Ramage. Very good. Go ahead, Ramage. Good afternoon, sir. My question for you today is, how is the Navy going to stop the continued cross-checking of sailors to meet many requirements on deployed ships? Sailors get sent to a parent command, and we do all the things the Navy says it's important to make a sailor feel part of the team, only to find after a short period of time they get cross-checked to another ship. Shipmate, great question, and I will tell you, your concerns have been our con same concerns uh, in the Manning world for you know, the, the past uh, at least half dozen years, I will say. Uh, right now, our end strength is about 325,000 sailors. Just a couple of years ago, it was about 322,000 sailors. 
The reason that you've seen and we've seen this 3,000 uh, roughly sailor uh, increase is to mitigate, uh, to try to eliminate to some degree the very problem that you're talking about with cross-decking of sailors. We recognize that it's disruptive to the unit, it's disruptive to the sailor, and we want to make sure that we're doing everything we can within the limits of our authority uh, and resources to prevent this from being an issue in the future. So I think you'll see it get better. Uh, we'll continue to work at it and hopefully one day we don't have this conversation. Good question. All right, thank you very much, Ramage. We now have a question that came in via social media. And it is, with the LCS program production slowly ramping up, have you looked at extending the life of the Hazard Class Frigate? Yeah, we have looked at the, the Hazard Class Frigate, by the way, the Oliver Hazard Perry Class Frigate, the guy from Lake Erie we just talked about from the, in, in 1813. Uh, it's been very effective. It has uh, been a workhorse of the fleet for a long time. It's perfect for counter-narcotics, but they're old, and they're becoming obsolete, and they're expensive to maintain. And the fact of the matter is, it's time for them to go ashore. Uh, so it's the little combat ship is our, our ship for the future, for the kinds of missions that that frigate, that mine sweeps, and that our patrol craft, uh, that they perform today. So the little combat ship is our ship of the future for these kind of missions. Uh, our next question is from the Seventh Fleet AOR. It is a pre-recorded question from USS George Washington. Uh, Good morning, CNO at McPond. Uh, this is Karen Thomas, MMC, aboard the USS George Washington MSC. Uh, my question is, I've read that there is a, the Navy is trying to increase the number of ships in the fleet, and I'm wondering how is that going to be feasible with the sequestration and the rumored number of decreases in CBNs? Okay. Well, that's a good question. It doesn't seem to make sense. But this is, uh, there's an important thing to remember. We have over 40 ships today under contract. 40, 40. Uh, we are delivering ships at an increasingly rapid pace. So the fact of the matter is, despite sequestration, when it comes to ships coming in uh, from, from commission, commissioning ships from new construction, that will go up no matter what. The impact of sequestration and reduced budget will be how many ships we may need to retire. And that's a, something that I'll need to balance, will need to balance with new construction. But we will grow uh, as far as bringing ships in. It's a matter of how many we lose so that the net, uh, due to the, how many we lose to retirement, so what is the net change? All right, thank you, sir. Uh, we have another question that came in from social media. It's on the Navy social media site. So Angel Rossi has a question for you, Mick Pond. Her question is, in regards to the Navy's Enhanced Carrier Presence Plan, if we implement this plan and expect to have more ships deployed at one time, is the Navy ready to increase the pay of sailors and the cost of maintaining deployed carriers and air wings out at sea? Sequestration will continue to decrease our budget. In fiscal year 13, the cuts implemented only in the last half of the year and were estimated to be a $37 billion in cuts. In fiscal year 14, cuts are estimated Costs are estimated to be at $52 billion. Is, there, is this plan still a go, or are we rethinking strategy? That's a complicated question. <laughs> That's a thoughtful <laughs> statement out there, huh? Somebody's been reading. I was just reading this morning. No. <laughs> uh, I think I got the, the gist of the question, and it's really about pay, and are we looking at increasing the pay of our sailors as we 